Right. Um, so this is, uh, given that nobody else is introducing me, I'll introduce me myself. I'm Philip Hans. I've been a Debian developer for ages, uh, and I've been slacking for ages. So uh, the reason I've been slacking most recently is because I've got some small children, Alexandra and Matilda, who may even be watching. I don't know. Um, so hi, kids. <laughs> um, and they're very distracting because, uh, you know, I want to go to the playground and so do they. And that means that if you're working on Debian installer, you write some tiny bit of shell script and then you have to test it in all sorts of different dimensions. And uh, you, you get about halfway through the tests and then you get called away to do something else and then you come back two hours later and you think, did I do that test? And so, well, you know, I know this is bound to work, so I'll just upload it and it all breaks. It's really irritating. So I thought what I should do is get some way of being able to, you know, push a, a, a commit and just have the computer do all the really tedious stuff that takes all the time. And then I can go off and play in the playground with my kids and I come back and I'll have a nice mail telling me that it all, it's all broken. And that will be uh, much more cheerful. And I'll actually get some stuff done because... Uh, at the moment, that's a demoralizing enough prospect so that I don't even start doing the, the, uh, the thing that would have ended up breaking everything. So, yes, let's start the demo going because, uh, yes, it takes ages and it's currently broken. <laughs> so, <laughs> it might work. Uh, so, this is Jenkins. Uh, the thing that's broken at the moment, what I was hoping to demo is that you can do a push and that triggers uh, the first part of this build. But, uh, and this bit's broken anyway, so I'll just kill that. Is this big enough? Can you read that okay? So this is a, a test rigger of Jen Jenkins because we inadvertently upgraded Jenkins on the, the main Jenkins server last night, and the triggers broke in a different way. So at the moment, the push isn't working, but everything else is working here, I think. Sometimes it carries on going for ages, and then some minor uh, plug-in upgrade means that the, the bits that you configure it with don't seem to be configuring it anymore. So I've got this thing for giving it a kick up the arse, which you shouldn't need to do. And then we'll leave that going. Uh, actually, I'll just show you that. There we go. So on this thing, is it actually doing it? Pending. Pending? It's no good. Ah, I see. Oh, wow. So, that, mm -hmm. so that's the job that wasn't started ages ago, and it's started now. <laughs> so it gives you this console output. You normally don't have to look at it. It updates in real time. This is building a UDEB of pre-seed. So it would have happened if I'd pushed a feature branch of... Uh, um, so I can create a new branch, push it, this will start building it, and it will drop it into a directory named after the branch. So that's what's going on there, and I'll leave it going just after it gets to the bottom, because it will kick off the next one, hopefully. I think I'll do it. Can, we can make it a bit bigger, I suppose. Is that better? So that's doing... Uh, Package build. Uh, finished. Yeah. Quite often says this aborted thing. Which one's that caused by? No. Hmm? Mm. Ah, yeah, okay. So that actually proves that this sort of works because. I, I dragged a, uh, a patch out of 
that I, I had failed to do anything with in 2010 and applied it about 20 minutes ago and thought, I'll do this demo and go see if it works. Well, that, sh that shows exactly what the problem is. So I could fix it now, but it'd be rather de tedious, so I'll not do that. So one thing that we've got is this kit hook, which you might be able to read. But basically what it, what it does is you can put a little bit git hook in that works out which directory it's in in our um, whole series of DI uh, Alioth git uh, repositories. And when you do the push, it nudges Jenkins. And then Jenkins goes, have I actually seen this uh, repository configured anywhere? OK, this job likes this repository, so I'll nudge that job. And then the, the job itself checks whether it wants to pay any attention to that particular commit. So you're not really opening anything up security-wise. There's no authentication on this. You're just suggesting to Jenkins that it might want to do something, which means that you can do that in any repository that you run as long as you get Jenkins to then go and look at that repository in response, which is pretty cool because it's, it, it means you don't have to have Jenkins checking every 10 minutes. You can as long as it's checking at all, so you can configure it to check once a day or something just to have that uh, box ticked. After that, it will react within seconds. And quite often, I don't get to the web interface before it's finished for UDEBs, which is really nice. So what happens then is uh, that Jenkins is provoked into action. And then uh, Jenkins is a... Yeah, I don't know whether I want to talk about that at the moment. But it, Jen, Jenkins is a Java and XML thing, which most people go, Ugh, Java, and then Ugh, XML. So then they, uh, they thought, let's wrap that in uh, Python. So they've got uh, a thing for taking YAML to XML, so you don't have to worry about XML or Jenkins too much. Um, then, uh, actually, uh, some of the, the, X, the YAML isn't powerful enough. If, you want, if you've got a huge matrix of possible tests that you could run and you only actually want to run a few of them, then it's really difficult to do in YAML. So we also generate YAML using another layer of Python. That's good. Um, then for the testing I'm doing, there's a thing called Cucumber, which, um, where have we got that? That's one of these. It's a bit of cucumber. Right, so cucumber is this uh, thing that you're meant to point at point management at, and they can write little scenarios because you know they're not meant to accept, they're not expected to understand any of this stuff. Uh, so, so you write this sort of like English as a normal user. I should be able to install Debian. Fair enough. And I want to. Uh, you can, this is a more complicated thing than you get out of a manager, I expect, because I wanted to try several scenarios uh, with several results. And it fills in the blank blanks. Uh, you can see these bits get replaced. So it saves a lot of typing if you do that. Um, that's written in Ruby, which you can't really tell from that. But the reason it What's, what's actually going on is that they're all uh, Ruby functions using these uh, matching bits. And then it picks out the variables from the English text and does stuff. So this is waiting for an image that's got name of user in its, uh, in its name. And when it gets it, it types the name and enter, and then it does it again for, it waits for that to go away, and then it looks for other things to come up on the screen, like user password or the, user, the show user password. So that, that one's the image where it's got the tick box from the new version that says, I want to show it. And it needs to be able to recognize all these different images. And it's really tedious to do all the screenshots. So we need to fix the, uh, uh, the workflow for getting that, but there's meant to be an OCR thing which will make it a lot easier because you'll then just be able to say, look for password on the screen and it can OCR it off the screen. 
but at the moment that's really noisy and just logs all over the place. So that's Cucumber, is this thing for controlling stuff, which inside it is actually using a thing called Sickly, which is doing all the image rec recognition. Um, and that runs a headless X and KVM and um, like that, so all nested together and drives the, the session so you're not preceding it like we normally do our tests with preceding. This is uh, pretending to type on the keyboard. Uh, you can also make it say, uh, look for this image on the, the, the screen and click to the left of it. And so you can drive uh, graphical user interfaces with it. Um, then there's under underneath uh, the Jenkins stuff, the thing that's actually doing the job are uh, uh, just shell scripts, which say, my job name is this, chop bits out of it, run a shell script, and that's how it's all controlled. So it, it looks incredibly complicated. There's lots of stuff going on. But actually, it's just a way of running a couple of shell scripts. And if you, um, you can join the jobs together so that when this job runs, if it succeeds, then it runs another job, and it takes some of its parameters and passes them on. So that's how I've got it so that uh, this sort of worked example that is going on in the Jenkins thing is it, once you do the push, it builds a UDEB or, and drops the UDEB into the name of the thing that you pushed. Then if you've got multiple, multiple UDEBs like that, it will be dropping all the UDEBs into that directory. And at the end, of, when it's done that, it builds uh, Debian installer with those UDEBs in the local UDEB uh, directory. So what you get out of the end of it is the current testing, well, you can decide which version, but the current testing or uh, SID DI with your personal <coughs> branch UDEBs on top which means that you can test anything you like. You're not doing any harm to anyone because you're not pushing it into the master branch. And you get a, a mini ISO out of the end, which you can then boot and do all this stuff to. And if the tests come out the other end, the, the test that I've been doing most often is doing an install to the end of several desktops, then letting it reboot and seeing whether it manages to get to a login prompt. Obviously, once you've done that, you can do much more. Because at every stage the, where a major decision is being made, you can snapshot it. And the snapshots allow, allow you to roll back to just that point. So if you snapshot it at the point where it's just ready to boot after the first boot, you can then say, actually, I want to see if Firefox is capable of getting on the network. And it's only the installing Firefox and running it bit that you have to test. And then you can have a load of these tests in parallel, and it fires through them pretty quickly. So uh, I've talked about Cucumber a bit. Um, yeah, the, the reason I'm using Cucumber is because Tails use it for their, their testing. They've got their scenarios tuned to the point that they actually have to have the success branch of what, you know, how I found the image pause for 10 seconds, because otherwise, if you're making a movie of the test session, it comes up, gets, gets the screenshot that it's looking for, and destroys the, uh, the snapshot before it's even managed to sample it enough to, to notice on the video that it's worked. So it just goes. So they, they put a 10 second pause in to, uh, to make sure that you actually get to see that Firefox managed to get on the net, and then the, it disappears, and the next thing happens. So, uh, um, and so Cucum what it's meant for, Cucumber, is. Uh, behavior-driven de development. So you're meant to get your manager to say, we want the project product to do this. And when, when you run that, it complains about the fact that you haven't got any functions defined. And then you're meant to fill in all the functions. And then you're meant to write the code. And you're meant to end up with a website or something. Um, all, the web, all, all the things that are talking about Cucumber are sort of saying, you shouldn't really use it for what we're using it for. But Tails were using it anyway. and. Uh, and it, and it did work. So uh, it took me a while to get to the point where it worked for us. It, and there's lots of rough ed edges I could really do with someone that understands Ruby better than I do to sort out all the rough edges. But 
it does actually work. It's pretty amazing when it does work. Um, so it's, it, it, all the bits could be uh, improved, but as it is, I think it's going to be pretty useful. Uh, Sickly is the thing for gra grabbing screenshots and typing things. You don't really know, you need to know that. It's got the OCR um, thing which is coming up. When that happens, it's going to make life a lot easier because you should be able to just say, here's a bit of text that is unique to that screen. And it, once it comes up, I know that I'm meant to be typing this other thing. At the moment, you have to... What the, the, the workflow I've been doing mostly is that you run the scenario, it gets to the end of it, it fails because you don't know what's meant to be on the screen. It, it gives you a screenshot. You take the screenshot, you chop out the bit that's going to be unique. You save that in a file. You run the whole thing again. And of course, because the, and this is why it's taken six months, because the early stuff gets fixed quite quickly. Every time you want to test it, it, it runs out to further away from you. And it can be an hour before you find out that you've cropped the image slightly too small and sickly can't recognize it, or you've cropped you've made it uh, not specific enough and it'll recognize it early and then start typing when it shouldn't have done and say that you're three steps beyond what you thought you were. Yeah, But now I'm getting to the point where um, if you have multiple images that could be on the screen, it tells you which one it's found. Um, there are some race conditions in that because it actually looks for the first one, looks for the second one, looks for the third one. So. If it looks for the first one and then the first one appears, it looks for the second one. If that's quite similar, it might recognize it as that and go off and do something else. So th these days what I do is look for the first, uh, look, look for them all. If it recognizes any of them, look for them all again. And that way you can sort of prioritize which one you really want to see. And uh, then you don't get so many false positives. Uh, right. There's also a remote shell hack, which uh, so you start a, a TTY on your virtual machine, and then you can connect to it. And in uh, in Tails, they have a, a particular uh, command line option to boot, uh, something like um, "never do this in production" or something. <laughs> and if that's there, it runs this little server which listens for commands, and you can run, tell it to run things as root, and uh, it gives you uh, the re response, it, the uh, result codes in uh, JSON. Um, we don't have that thing in DI by default, so uh, we we I, at the moment I'm just running a busybox shell. And for reasons not apparent, you get a double echo and a load of uh, control characters out of um, every uh, command prompt. The, the echo for what is actually going on is fine. The output is fine. So with a bit more clever uh, recognition on the Ruby side of things, should be able to pick things out of that. That means I mean, at the moment, all I'm doing is uh, I've got it here. Is there any questions or, you know, is this, uh, am I going too fast, too slow, anything like that? You all okay with this so far? Okay. What? Well, no, throw them in the middle, I don't mind. Because uh, then I'll have some idea of what's actually interesting people. I don't want to bore you all to death. So, yeah, I really like the way it's actually stacking together, even though you've got so many different components. <laughs> you to, the, I think it's horrific. The test all these bits actually does work, because there's, there's not many other ways of doing that. Yeah. I know, I know you've got so many different languages involved, and you're stitching things stitching together with gather tape, but actually uh, getting it, to, getting it uh, to the point where you can actually test that kind of stuff is really important. Um, yeah, I'd really like to work out a way of bolting uh, a text interaction thing onto yeah. the back end so that with the same scenario you can say actually I'm going to use SSH over the net to the target machine because most of the time you don't care whether the, pro the colors are right yeah. and things like that and if, if someone changes the, the background color on the installer then I imagine all my PNGs will be dead and I'll have to do them all again which will be really tedious. 
Uh, whereas if you're doing it in text mode and talking to it via SSH, you don't have to do any recognition. You've just got the text. You've just got the text. So if you, but I don't want to replace the cucumber thing because some things you do actually care. If yeah. there's a, a bug at the moment where um, the increased font size option isn't working in DI, so you actually want to be able to see that the the font size is bigger in the graphical installer at that point. Yeah, let's not go to the point of trying to work out whether the um, installer with speech synthesis actually works and how we can test that. Well, yeah, that's got to be uh, worth doing as well because... <laughs> if, we, if we can work out how to do that. Yeah, I don't know how you... Because it's going to be pretty similar. Um, the sounds are going to be fairly similar to one another. It's not like speech recognition. You're, not, you're just recognising that particular noise that it always makes when it's asking you for that prompt. Yeah. So I, I think you should be able to do that, and you should be able to say if the noises are sort of vaguely similar with some rubbishy comparison thing, that's probably enough, because if it's radically different or it doesn't come out of the speaker at all, then uh, that's bad. So the testing of the actual text base and SSH and that kind of thing, that's a separate test because you're not testing the, um, the way that installer is used on, on, um, on well, typical machines. Well, not so really it's, because... It's, an, it's another parallel test, isn't well, it? Well, it's, it's sort of... A, well, it's applying the same... You can apply the same test through a different user interface. Okay. Effectively. So I've, I've got it at the moment so that in that table of scenarios you can say that I want the, uh, the VT or the, the text user interface and I want to install a graphical thing or vice versa. You can do all the combinations but with I, that. Yeah, ideally we should be able to test the whole matrix, isn't it? But yeah, absolutely. So Although it's, it's a bit pointless, actually. If you can install it using the graphical installer and all the way to the end, and then you can install the same thing um, in the text installer, there's probably not a point of going through all the desktops in no. series and then yeah. doing both of them. Yeah. So it's worth doing one or other twice. You need what, to identify twice. which paths and test, and test each yeah. path. Is, is, is yeah. Best so I think as long as you've covered most of the paths, then the only reason to do more than that is if you actually find a bug where it only manages to install GNOME if you do it in text mode or, yeah. or something like that. So I, th I think. It would actually be quite nice to use the behavior-driven development idea by taking things out of the bug tracking system mm. and saying this person is saying that they can't do this thing. So we write down the scenario that they're trying to do that doesn't work as the cucumber thing. And we can start the scenarios. And then we can start, start we building that and seeing why it doesn't work. And by the end of it, you should have a bug fix that sort of ties into that, and you just keep the scenario forever, yes. run it once a month, yeah. and then that's a bug. I've, I've had loads of features in uh, preceding, and I use preceding in some pretty odd ways. So nobody ever, nobody else ever explores the code paths that I wrote to handle that, and, uh, and they just break because nobody is even aware that that code path exists, really. For so instance, setting a, an early command on the command the boot command line in DI Doing that. doesn't work in, uh, in Stretch at the moment mm. because um, we swapped the order that the preceding was happening and the execution of the early command is tied to one of the precede packages and <laughs> that got moved slightly earlier. So it would go, um, has it been preceded in a file? Oh, let's try running the early command and then we'll in interpret the whatever's on the command line. So it gets preceded, it just never gets used. It's not very useful. The other one we found on a similar level is we're using preceding for um, smaller parts of the actual testing where we're trying to test whether a, a kernel that's not fully mainline yet uh, can actually provide enough services for DI to run. Yeah. So in that kind of situation, we don't care whether it can actually install No, We don't want it to just... In, uh, install a, a standard system. Yeah, we're getting somewhere we get like the password prompt. prompt or the, yeah, the, the, could, the we, do you want an English prompt and you're yeah. away. One of, the, one of the things we found with the preceding is late command is a single command that can't be a list of commands. Want a bet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we need to talk about that because we could... Well, you just, you just make it semicolon separated and <laughs> you can have as, as much as you like. Yeah, but it, when, so when we have a precede file sent in 
for as part of the test, and we want to add our own lake commands onto there. It, that a semicolon list is actually harder to um, to to work out where you put our commands relative to everyone else's commands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but you can do it. Um, the, the real thing is. Um, we need to be able to adapt this to live image testing as well. This, cause it's basically yeah, well, it's, I mean, it, because this isn't pre-seeding, you don't have to know anything about the internals of the thing. You just know what it looks like. Yeah. So, so you, you boot the live image. You look at it. Did it seem, does it seem to have booted? Yeah. Fair enough. Click there. That's it. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's the, the good thing about it is that you can do this thing where what you're looking for is the user interface talking to you in the way that you want the user interface to talk to you. And if it doesn't do that, it's either because someone's changed the, the colors or the fonts, which you can fix quite quickly. And, and the person that can fix it doesn't have to be the person that wrote the test. And doesn't have to be the person that wrote the Ruby and doesn't. So it, it breaks the job up quite nicely, which is good. And um, the, is, it, is it all Kuimu? Um, are you actually calling Kuimu to start the actual operations? Ruby is calling Kuimu somewhere down there. So we should be able to configure that to be able to test the EFI QEMU with stuff as yeah, well? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I don't know that much about boots things, so I've not, I was looking at the iBugs uh, this morning, trying to pick one that I could fix during this lecture, but um, I don't know, know enough about firing off, uh, that, that was potentially one of them, except that uh, I, uh, I didn't know how to start QEMU. So come along, do that bit. So one thing that would be great is if anybody that likes Ruby would come along and look at the appalling mess that I've made of what was the Tails bits of this and undestroy them. Um, there's something similar going on in Python. Uh, I, I very occasionally write Python code. I don't write Ruby code at all. So my, my Python and my Ruby are probably appalling. I don't know enough about either of them to know. Um, there are loads of things. Once you've got this thing mostly working, it doesn't even have to work very reliably because Jen Jenkins can be told to run it every four hours. If it works three quarters of the time, then you get to see a nice traffic light thing where yeah, it's sort of working. And that, that means that the thing that you're testing is probably fine and it's the, uh, the tests themselves that are flapping, which is great because it means that like when we're doing a, a point release, the people can um, be assured that it's installed once after they've, after, when they're planning to do the release, they can see, if they look at the Jenkins thing, they can see that the push that caused them to be ready for, for doing it has been built, has been installed. So that gives, gives an extra confidence uh, that the thing that they're doing is actually going to work. Obviously, we're not testing everything at the moment, so when bugs come along that, um, do something to the installer which I'm not testing, that's just a prompt to test something else and we, we can explore more paths through the thing and over time we should be able to make it so that it's actually quite difficult to get a bug past it. Um, I was talking to uh, Ben Hutchins about um, getting new kernel pushes to be built and then uh, booting if we, if we keep our images around that we've got to the point of first boot, then we can use QMU to boot with a more recent kernel without having to do anything to the image because you've got the operating system. You can boot QMU using this image that's outside the, the, the image, um, outside the file system. And then see, well, it's a pretty good test. Just see if it can present you with a login prompt. It's done quite a lot of stuff by then. If you know of things that don't work after that, you can, we can write tests for it, and that's great. Um, and uh, the chap who's doing screen for DI, he hasn't really got any rights to upload stuff uh, at the moment. So this is going to, I'll, I'm going to be talking to him soon about this. Should be able to make it so that he can do pushes to feature, feature branches of any new deb that he needs to touch to make that work and it'll get it built into a mini ISO by, by the system without him having to do anything and then tested. So I think that's pretty cool. 
also his the screen stuff uh, will mean that we can maybe do the SSH testing and have the backdoor shell thing by just doing you know control A. Uh, Mike, well, what are you saying? I can just repeat it. Were you, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, which bit of the stack is actually doing the control A? Is that Cucumber or was uh, Sickly? Or uh, Cucumber uh, is well. It's actually Sickly that's that's pressing the buttons. But if you're using SSH, then you don't need Sickly because it'd be a pretty stupid thing to have a SSH session running in a headless X terminal and then trying to recognise what was on the screen doing image recognition when the data is actually coming out of the box. So um, probably doing it in some, I presume Ruby has some sort of expect equivalent library so you could just do uh, send, a, uh, send and receive on that. person to talk to there is Antonio Tessero because he's probably done that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so I think hopefully we can make it so it's much easier for people to contribute to DI, and that they're not. It's pretty scary trying to uh, change DI at the moment, because there's just so many ways you can break things, even with a one character change. Because it's BusyBox shell, so it doesn't support all the things that you uh, you know for certain have been supported in shell for 20 years, and you you can specify options to said that don't exist. And it looks fine. You can even run it in your desktop version of BusyBox, and it still works. And on DI, it won't work. So having some way of just doing the cross-check so that you know that you're not doing something silly without having to put yourself in public and ask someone else to use the UDEV that you just built. Uh, you know. um, so yeah, we live on uh, Debian QA doing this stuff on the IFTC network. I'm Phil, F-I-L. Um, I'm quite happy to, if you've got a thing that you want tested, come up with a test. Because at the moment, I'm, I, my biggest problem is that I haven't got useful tests. I think it should be driven by bugs, really. So rather than coming up with tests that work, which if you do that, then you write tests which probably won't notice when it breaks. <laughs> so yeah, it's working great. Uh, well, actually, it's not working. It's just you're looking for the uh, the outside of the window and the inside of the window is full of nonsense. Um, so if if there are things which you think might be testable like this, and which we, we, there's a bug which we can look for the thing that is the bug and then notice when it's gone away or vice versa then I think that's a really good way of writing tests without wasting time writing tests that will never fail. Uh, I think that's it. How are we doing? Well, it's not too bad. I wasn't expecting to last that long. We still have around 10 minutes, so if you okay. have any questions. Are there any, any other questions? So I have some comments from IRC. Oh, yeah. Alexandra is watching. Hey, hello, Alexandra. And she's wearing her Dabkov Heidelberg T-shirt. <laughs> And Matilda is less interested and is trying to stuff a pencil up her nose. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> more questions? It's more of a thank you for doing it. It's super great. And it's innovation that we definitely need. So thank you very much. Yeah, well, you should thank uh, Matilda. Because, Thank you because she's the one that's totally destroyed my ability to do anything in, in more than half hour chunks. So uh, this way I can do a push after 20 minutes and relax rather than not do the push and then for six months have this cloud hanging over me thinking I really ought to test that stuff. So, you know, um, it's... It's taken an enormous amount of time, mostly because I can't just write Ruby out of the top of my head, so I have to go and find something to cut and paste it from. Um, and then if you do that, half the things that you find are on uh, Stack Exchange or something, which means you can't cut and paste them because the license is uh, interesting. So you have to be inspired by them instead, which means you have to do a bit more reading. 
<laughs> yeah, so it's taken a while. But it's good. I really like when, when it works. Sadly, it's not working today. But um, when it really works, it's just astonishing because it's so easy to use. The, 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 the user interface is just Git. The, what we've got at the moment is uh, that if you have any branch that you push into any of the DI packages, and there's no reason to limit this to DI packages, anything on Alioth, anything that you can persuade Holger to uh, point Jenkins at, uh, and he's really easy to persuade. Um, so, uh, yeah, patch is very, very, very welcome. Um, once you get to the point where Jenkins is actually looking at the repository, you just push a branch and it'll get on, get on with it. Uh, at the moment, we've restricted it to only react to branches that are called pu slash something. Um, there's no reason for doing that. They it could also be doing the master branches of you know loads of packages. The resources available are astonishing. Uh, Profit Bricks have donated loads of uh, hardware for us to use. So the main Jenkins machine's got 19 cores or something, I think. Or well, last time I looked, it's probably about 25 by now. What about, <laughs> what about storage? I can think of tests that I'm thinking of where uh, uh, yeah, we actually I'm, need to use Jenkins to build artifacts, which then get submitted to other things to do the test. Absolutely, yeah. There's loads of storage. Right. I keep on bumping into limits, but that's because I'm using, I, I'm doing most of my testing on a little VM. And I keep on filling the disk, and then we redo it uh, twice as big, and I fill the disk. But uh, the main, the main one is, uh, well, we had to move the uh, VM stuff off from Jenkins because there's some minor difference in the CPUs on the hardware, which means that it runs 30 times slower on the actual main box than on. Uh, on the one we're using at the moment. That's not just the KVM models not loaded or something. Uh, you, I can't see any difference between <laughs> anything at all. And all the flags are the same. But you can see the BIOS going doop, 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 character at a time as it's giving you the uh, I'm booting thing. It takes about, uh, I think it was 23 minutes to get to the first useful uh, prompt in, uh, um, in the installer. Oh yeah, I've got a. I can fake a, uh, a demo. What are we going here? Oh yeah, I can. Is anybody interested in the internals of this stuff, or do they want to leave me <laughs> giggling insanely in my cupboard? <laughs> this is uh, how the breakpoints work. It's uh, this. It's an awful combination of Ruby syntax and English, <laughs> where you can sort of kick it into doing things. Yeah, <laughs> what you mean, my layout? I think I inherited that from the Tails thing, but it's got these. It's so it's pretending to be one of those freeform things, but then they put it all in quotes so they can loop over it. Um, this is the. So at the moment, the remote execution thing, it doesn't really work. But I can get it to uh, run echo hello and then recognize the fact that it said hello, which sounds like it's a totally worthless thing to do. But actually, if you suspend the machine and then resume it, you've no idea how soon it's going to come back up. And so you can either look at the screen and hope for the best. And, and what happens then, is, which is great fun to diagnose, is that it flashes the suspended screen at you momentarily. Then it thinks about how the hell to get hold of the disk for a while. Meanwhile, your script has gone, oh, I saw the prompt, twink, which gets thrown away. <laughs> and then you're one screen out of sequence, and it all goes wrong. So it's actually quite useful to have a thing that if you type echo hello at it, it says hello, because you can keep on doing that at the not quite unsuspended machine. And when it finally comes back, it replies with a hello, and then you can carry on with your script. So even the really brain-damaged version of that is useful. If I had someone that was interested in that weird little niche in Ruby, then we could probably make it a lot better you know, by top-and-tailing 
all commands with some strings to recognize and writing. The, it's difficult to do though because it's uh, BusyBox uh, shell and you haven't, I'm trying to do it without actually modifying the image. So you kind of have to survive that broken shell long enough to inject a real command that you can use into it and notice that you've really done it and then you can run that command. Um, and then we can start doing the thing that uh, uh, the Tails folk do where you say, I'd like you to run this command as a user. Well, it's not very useful in DI, that bit. But I wanted you to run this command and give me the output in a particular format or, or whatever. Um, yeah, I was going to show you a movie. I'll show you a movie for the last little bit. I was trying to find that on jengas.net. What's, hmm? what's the path to that view? What? What's the part? What's the URL to that view? So I was trying to find uh, it in Jenkins. Oh, uh, it's so I paste it into our scene. Yeah. So. This is a machine that's not really in public use, but you can. You're welcome to look at it. Uh, uh, where are we? Where do you want it? That's dead composer. WQI term, that'll do. There you go. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> nope, you wouldn't be able to find that, would you? <laughs> yeah, it's just one of the little VMs uh, that's been set up on Profit Bricks. And it's got a copy of Jenkins on it because that way I can thoroughly trash Jenkins and add more. Uh, plugins and things like that. So somewhere on there, there's the mini ISO job. Yeah. You're welcome to have a look. Uh, there we go. I can't recognize it when it's all uh, blown up. And so in there you see GUI, LXD, LXD, MPEG. Right. So this is a recording of a previous install. And I type, so it tabs down to here and then types a load of shit onto the uh, command line to get the, uh, the early command to work. And in theory to change the non, it, it tends to blank the screen, which is really annoying. So, uh, which is why I couldn't actually test the, the, the recent stuff because the, uh, during the downloading thousands of packages thing, it does uh, five minutes of that and then the screen goes away. You don't see anything anymore. <laughs> Although now I've got a loop that keeps on pressing F3 or something, which the, the GUI seems not to mind you pressing F3 all the time. And the nice thing about this is that you get a, an email saying it's all broken. And rather than having to install it yourself, you can fast forward through it. And then you can get to the end, which is pretty cute. This is the first reboot going on. And then you notice, that's taking a long time. I thought System D was meant to be quicker than this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty certain it's nothing to do with System D. But, uh, so it got five seconds into the boot, and now it's, <gasps> oh, there we go. So a couple of minutes in, it's gone sort of bang in some way. And then we have another minute. So anybody that knows why this is happening in uh, VMs under stretch, and then it does this. That's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something to do about with, um, the, well, part, the, the first long pause, I think, is something to do with uh, uh, the graphics. There's something with the graphics and the way it happens inside uh, when you're running KVM inside KVM. And the combination of those two things, this is why you don't actually see it in real installs, but it'd be quite nice to fix because this makes the test when you've 
generated all the images, you've run the thing to the end, and then you snapshot it, sh shotted it. If you run that test again, it should do it from the last snapshot, which takes about 12 minutes at the moment because it's looking at this. It should take about 20 seconds to, to boot three different desktops. It's booting. And then eventually, that's the screen switch, lovely. And then very briefly, you'll see a login prompt. And then it goes, yep, that's why. Or was it so briefly that we didn't see it? No, there it is. It recognizes this bit, and that's your first boot, all good. So that, that counts as a success, and that's why you end up with uh, So that scenario that I showed you before is all here. Uh, and, and it's got filled in a little table. And the fact that there are no errors around the place indicates that it worked. And you've got three scenarios, all the steps, and it tells you what happened. So <laughs> what? Time's up. OK, cheers.